anybody out there that's watching this program? This is the life of Mary Lincoln. And um, I'm not a author, but I did do a lot of research. And I tried to pick the things that I knew could be verified in history. Um, I'm going to start off with a brief timeline. Mary Todd Lincoln was born in Lexington, Kentucky, the fourth child of Robert and Eliza Todd. Um, she was possibly a favored child in the beginning of when her mother was living. She was allowed to sit in on political conversations that her father had, especially with Henry Clay. When she was almost six years old, her mother passed away following the birth of the sixth child, no, excuse me, the eighth child. They had, um, her father and mother had two children that passed away early on. Um, the first, the first one died, and there was, the interesting thing is that they named both of these sons Robert. And uh, the one passed away um, shortly after it was born. The other one passed away at age two. And now her father, couldn't see trying to raise these children on his own. He remarried in less than a year after Mary's beloved mother's death. Her father fathered 10 more children, one of which died shortly after birth. And the strange thing about that is They had named that child Robert. So he did not have any children, any descendants named Robert. There are a lot of strange things that went on <laughs> in Mary's life that will give you an idea of why she acted the way she did, why she was, um, well, in Europe, she was known to be eccentric, which was pretty good. They liked eccentric people in Europe. Uh, here in the United States, they didn't care very much for eccentric people. Um, the children that uh, Elizabeth, Humph Elizabeth Humphreys had, those nine children um, were her favorites. She did not care at all for the firstborn in the family. Um, she tried to ignore them. Um, she allowed Mammy Sally, who was uh, Mary's nanny, to pretty much raise Mary. Um, she was enrolled in boarding school at age eight. Now that was not unusual. Uh, but the school was right there in Lexington. It was the Shelby Female Academy. Mary got a really well-rounded education there at the academy. She even learned to knit and sew 
and do some cooking, although she never was very good at the cooking um, part of it. She did not like math. This will show up later on in her life uh, as being one of her problems. She graduated at the age of 14. Most of her peers did not go beyond this in school. However, Mary was enrolled in Charlotte Mantel's boarding school. The Todd's buggy driver, Nelson, would drive her to school on Monday and retrieve her on Friday afternoon. So she was only in the home in her home uh, over the weekends. In Charlotte's boarding school, she learned to read, write, and speak French. And she loved poetry. This was something that will show up again later on. Only two other girls stayed at the school through the week. Her stepmother surely was glad to have Mary out of the house. Um, one of the strange little stories that I picked up from a couple of different places, actually. Uh, one morning, Mary's stepmother was served her coffee by probably one of the girls. And uh, she went, went ahead and put what she thought was sugar in her coffee and <clears throat> discovered when she drank the first sip of coffee that it was salt instead of sugar. She knew immediately who was the instigator of this little um, change in flavor. And she started calling Mary the limb of Satan. Mary did not have a good time with her stepmother. Fortunately, the stepmother didn't treat her sisters, Mary's full sisters, uh, that much better. Um, Mary Uh, let's see, where, where is she? <laughs> where is she now? Uh, Mary is... Uh, living at home after she graduated from Char Charlotte Mantel School. Um, her sister, Elizabeth, had married and was living in... Um, Springfield, Illinois. Um, Frances Todd, not married yet, was living in the Edwards home also. In, um, well, let's see. In 1836, Mary decides that she's going to go and live with her two sisters in Springfield. Uh, they say two's company and three's a crowd. Mary found out after she moved in with these sisters that they were going to find a suitable husband for Mary. They gave her a very hard time. They were bent on finding this suitable husband. The stay only lasted six months. She went back to Lexington and worked as an aide to the teacher of the youngest children at the Shelby Academy, 
where she had attended school. She was there for almost two years, uh, living at home, if you can call it a home. <laughs> After Frances married, Mary felt that she was safe to return to Springfield. She was almost 21. And if you read your um, history correctly, uh, a woman of 18 years of age was considered to be an old maid if she did not have a suitable beau. And here she is at 21, still not having a suitable beau. As the saying goes, you are likely familiar with the rest of this story. She met Mr. Lincoln formally at a ball, and the courtship followed. They became engaged, and then Lincoln broke off the engagement out of concern that Mary would not be happy with him. Friends got them back together, kind of secretly, and they ended up getting married in the Edwards home, November 4th, 1842. They lived in a boarding house at first. Robert was born while they were living there. <clears throat> they found that that was not suitable living for a mother and baby. So this is the picture of the home that the Todds moved to uh, when Mary was 12 years old. They are now calling it uh, the Mary Todd Layton home. She only lived there six years. She was born in another home, another brick home uh, there in Lexington. And I think that home, if I remember right, has been demolished. And now they're calling this the Mary Todd Lincoln home and giving tours. This is the house on 8th and Jackson Street. Uh, they did not live here all that long. Um, they're, all their children, except for Robert, were, were born in this home. And it is, still stands today. They give tours through it. This was the only home the Ellingtons ever owned. Um, growing up in this home, were Robert Todd, Edward Baker, William Wallace, and Thomas. Edward Baker passed away at the three years of age. Um, Mary was very heartbroken when her little Eddie passed away. Nine months later, William Wallace Lincoln was born. And at this time, Mary decided to join the First Presbyterian Church in Springfield. Uh, she was the only one that ever joined a church. Mr. Lincoln did not join a church. Um, In 1860, May 18th, Lincoln was nominated by the Republican Party for the presidency. In November of that year, Mr. Lincoln was elected 16th President of the United States. In February, they left Springfield for the last time as a family. This was an exciting time for Mr. Lincoln uh, and for Mary. Mary had always said from the age 12 that she was going to live in the White House sometime. 
She was um, a very political person, um, thanks to her father's letting her sit in on conversations between himself and Henry Clay. Um, the Clays and the Todds were very close, and um, Mary actually visited in their home several times. Although having lost her mother at an impressionable, impressionable age of five created a deep void within Mary Lincoln's from which she never recovered. That coupled with her inability to accept the deaths of sons, Eddie, and after they moved into the White House, had been there approximately a year, Willie passed away. It led to perpetual depression and anxiety that she tried to cure with frequent shopping excursions and trying to win the love and affection of those around her. In the end, she may have assembled quite a collection of beautiful wares, but it cost her the respect of admirers. Mary's losses also included the deaths of two half-brothers, Samuel, a Confederate soldier who was mortally wounded at the Battle of Shiloh, and Alec, a Confederate killed at the Battle of Baton Rouge. She also lost a brother-in-law, Confederate General Benjamin Helm, during the Battle of Chickamauga. Ben was married to Mary's little sister, Emily, and Mary was very close to this little sister. Some knowing her fondness of brothers accused her of traitorous behavior during the war. Little did Mary know that although the war was coming to a close, her battles were just beginning. We see Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural in, on March 4th, 1865. He had been concerned that he would not be reelected. Mary was more concerned because she had a lot of debts. She had spent rather foolishly sometimes on um, clothing, jewelry, and so on. Um, she was looking forward to her husband's second term as a president. General Lee surrendered to General Grant Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia on April 9th of 1865. Um, it had been announced that the Lincolns would be attending the theater on April 14th. Um, before they went to the theater, they took a carriage ride where they rekindled their relationship with intimate conversation. It was decided that later that evening, they would attend the showing of Our American Cousin in Ford's Theater, along with Senator Harris' daughter, Clara, and her fiance, Major Henry Rathbone. The presidential party arrived at the theater late, but became happily situated inside the freshly decorated presidential box at the orchestra, as the orchestra played Hail to the Chief. When the applause died down, the play began. About an hour and a half into the performance, Mary intimately slipped her hand into her husband's and leaned over to ask him what the others in their group would think of her bold display of affection. Before she could absorb his response, a man entered the box and pointed a revolver at the back of the president's head and pulled the trigger. Lincoln slumped over. Mary's screams echoed throughout the theater 
and those who witnessed the shooting never forgot the wretched moans that came from Mary over the next few moments. Oh my God, she said, have I given my husband to die? Lincoln was quickly removed from the theater to um, a private home across the street from the theater. The hysterical Mary and her companion Clara followed closely behind. Their gowns spattered with Major Rathbone's blood from a saber wound he received while trying to subdue Booth. Lincoln's unresponsive body was laid on a bed on the second floor in a bedroom there. Mary clung to, clung to him, begging for a response. The men in attendance were unable to tolerate Mary's hysteria at, at a time when she should have been consoled and allowed to remain at her husband's side. She was forcefully removed from the room and taken downstairs to a parlor. For the next nine hours, she anxiously, anxiously, excuse me, awaited her husband's death. Robert, who had been fetched to the home earlier, divided his time between consoling his mother and sitting beside his father's lifeless body. Mary was finally permitted another visit with her husband and collapsed. By the time she was revived, her husband was dead. Um, I cannot imagine what it, what it might have been like for poor Mary at this point. She later wrote of his death. I often think it would have been some solace to me had perhaps have lessened the grief, which is now breaking my heart. If my idolized had passed away after an illness and I had been permitted to watch over him and tend him to the last, and then she could have, then to the last, then she could have thanked him for his lifelong, almost, devotion to me, and I could have asked forgiveness for any inadvertent moment of pain I may have caused him. Mary did not attend her um, husband's funeral and had no family members from Springfield come to her side during the difficult period. She became bedridden for the next 40 days and refused callers who came to offer their sympathy, which in turn created talk of her impropriety in dealing with her husband's death. President Andrew Johnson was anxious to settle into the White House and his new role. However, he patiently waited for Mary to leave the White House during her period of confinement, she was oblivious to the goings-on around her. The White House staff took advantage of her preoccupation and began looting valuable items. The following year, the Congressional Committee on House Appropriations investigated the thefts and whether Mary had had a hand in the disappearance of these items. She was cleared of any involvement. <laughs> and if you think about all of the um, investigations that go on today, nothing has changed. Mary began to comp contemplate her future. Most suggested she return to Springfield, but to return to Springfield where she had enjoyed so much gaiety with her husband was out of the question. It was also the place where she had lost Eddie and finally decided on Chicago. And on the same day that the Union chose to celebrate their victory in war, Mary, Robert, and Tad boarded a train for Chicago. 
I go hence with every hope of life almost crushed. Alas, all is over with me. The three settled along Lake Michigan in the Hyde Park Hotel. It was there that while walking the shores of Lake Michigan, she allowed herself to think of her husband and grieve. For the most part, she became a recluse and allowed few people into her world. And for those she did interact with, they concluded that Mary was still very consumed by the events of the evening her husband was assassinated. Today, we recognize her behavior as post-traumatic stress disorder. Robert remained active, busied himself by accepting a position as an apprentice in a law firm. Mary, Mary's yearly purse amounted to $1,500. By the fall of 1865, she and Tad moved into the Clifton House, a boarding house that was home to mostly newcomers and transients. Robert refused to join the two, feeling that their new accommodations were dreary. In actuality, he was trying to distance himself from his mother. Creditors began knocking on the door to collect debts incurred during her White House years. To pay off some of the debts, she sold her gowns and returned jewelry and other items to a place of purchase. She refinanced and remaining, the remaining debt with a wealthy, wealthy financier at a very high interest rate. She hired Alex Williamson to handle her financial affairs and try to raise contributions for the Mary Lincoln Fund. Through his efforts, Mary was able to pay off vast amounts of her debt. Although many frowned on her methods, regardless, she was proud of her accomplishment. It is imperative that I should do something for my relief, and I want you to meet me in New York between the 30th of August and 5th of September next to assist me in disposing of a portion of my wardrobe, Mrs. Lincoln to Elizabeth Keckley, and you will see the picture of Elizabeth Keckley, her closest friend, her confidant, um, I guess probably pretty much her nurse, during her times of confinement. Elizabeth was her dressmaker and um, was a half black, half white. No, actually, uh, yeah, half black, half white. Um, she was a very attractive woman, very well educated for a black person. Um, one of the things that drew those two together was the fact that Elizabeth's only son, who was had white features, apparently, and his skin was white enough that he could be in the army with other young white men. And he was killed in one of the early battles of the Civil War. This drew them together because Mary had lost two sons. But her accomplishments was, accomplishment was overshadowed by the fact that other wartime widows were receiving much more in, contrib in contributed funds than she was receiving. It was another blow to her um, already wounded self. In 1866, Simon Cameron promised to raise $20,000 for Mary, and in light of the promise, she purchased a house on West Washington Street in Chicago. The purchase, she hoped, would bring the family together under one roof. Robert did not support her in this purchase, 
especially since she didn't have the funds, only a promise. Sure enough, Simon Cameron, interest in Mary, waned after he won a senatorial nomination. Mary was frustrated by the broken vow and took it upon herself to secure the necessary funds. She sought out those individuals whose careers had been helped by her husband. Robert became irritated at his mother's, at his mother's begging, and his opinion of her fell into alignment with her critics. Unable to afford the house, Mary rented it out and became a vagabond. She felt no place was home for her. Her public humiliation continued. In November of 1866, Lincoln's former law partner, William Herndon, Herndon went public with a story that, was, that it was Ann Rutledge who had been Lincoln's true love, not Mary Lincoln. He called the marriage of Lincoln's a domestic hell. For the last 23 years of his life, Mr. Lincoln had no joy. Mary didn't respond publicly. Instead, she endured the living hell in solitude. It was during this time that others came to her defense and denied the claims made by Herndon, who was considered an irresponsible alcoholic. Robert also came to his mother's defense during this time and tried to persuade Herndon to drop the story, but he was unsuccessful. The, uh, her husband's estate was finally settled in 1867. Mary inherits, inherits almost $37,000. Um, nothing that was said on beyond this until later. Um, in 1868, son Robert marries Mary Eunice Harlan in Washington, D.C. Uh, they did, she and Ted did attend the wedding. And uh, just a few days later, Mary and Tad leave for Europe. Um, Mary packed her belongings in what she termed poor boxes and traveled for the first time in her life unaccompanied. Both Robert and Tad were in Washington testifying at the trial of John Surratt. Mary made her way to the spas of Racine, Wisconsin where she took advantage of the therapeutic effect. While there, she began to feel better and seemed to garner a clearer sense of her predicament. She formulated a plan to raise money that included selling an entire White House wardrobe. She no longer needed these clothes as she had taken to wear a widow's garb since her husband's death. She immediately journeyed to New York, where she planned the sale of, under the alias of Mrs. Clark. But it was only a matter of days until her identity was discovered, and she was blasted by the press once again. The trial at this sale was a fiasco. She sold hardly anything. The people that were running the sale had put such high prices on things that nobody would purchase. She returned to Chicago in time to read the Chicago Journal's coverage. The most charitable construction that Mary Lincoln's friends can put on her strange course is that she is insane. Robert's opinion of his mother seemed to move in the same direction. More specifically, he wrote to his future wife, Mary Harlan, uh, 
My mother is one subject not mentally responsible. It is hard, very hard to deal with someone who is sane on subjects but one. She referred, he referred to her mishandling of money. Robert Todd Lincoln became increasingly embarrassed by his mother's actions. Later that year, Mary learned that the news, a newspaper article that her late husband's estate was ready for disbursement. Neither Robert nor David Davis, who was handling the affair, bothered to tell her. She also learned that through, though she, although she was receiving a mere 130,000, oh no, excuse me, was receiving a mere $130 a month to live on. Since Lincoln's death, Robert was receiving twice that amount. It infuriated her since she had given up her house in Washington Street because her request to Davis for an additional income to afford the house were rejected. Yet her son's request for more money had been awarded. He even received extra money to decorate his bachelor's quarters. Davis was now prepared to divide Lincoln's assets, 110,000 between Robert Tad, with Robert as guardian, and Mary. Um, this is probably a little out of place here. Uh, on September 24th, 1868, Mary attends the wedding of Robert and Mary Eunice, Eunice Harlan in Washington, D.C. Wishing to leave the United States at all the humiliation, both public and private, Mary and 15-year-old Tad boarded a steamer in 1868 bound to Europe, but, before, but not before attending the wedding. For the next two years in Frankfurt, Germany, Mary, Frankfurt, Germany became Mary's home. There her eccentricities were seen as just that and not insanity. She was liked, liked and even admired abroad. In 1869, she became a grandmother, and although the relationship with Robert was strained, Mary passed advice freely on to her daughter-in-law about marriage and motherhood. Don't mope around the house, attend operas and concerts, she advised. Her life became leisurely, and when she wasn't sending lavish gifts to both her daughter-in-law and granddaughter, she was reading books and walking along the main. She journeyed to Baden-Baden and enjoyed the sole first baths, followed by Nice, where she enjoyed the climate. Was there ever such a climate, such a sunshine, such air, flowers growing in the gardens, oranges on the trees? They visited Abbott's Abbotsford, Drybaugh, west to dear old Scotia, Burns' birthplace, went to Greenock, um, heaved a sigh of relief at poor Highland Mary's grave, went out into the ocean, entered Finnville's cave and Glencoe castles, innumerable. Baltimore. Back in Frankfurt, Mary was surprised and delighted to receive a visit from her old friend Sally Orne. The two spent ensuing days together reminiscing. Mary's lighthearted light nature reappeared briefly. And um, they were They were uh, disciplined by their neighbors on either side of them at the hotel for being so loud and giggling so much. Um, seeing Mary, seeing Sally, Mary's spirit had begun, she began 
petitioning for a pension once again, and after such much belated debate in Washington, President Grant signed the bill providing an annual pension of $3,000. When the French invaded Germany, Mary and Tad journeyed to Milan, Lake Como, Florence, before returning to Chicago, where they boarded with Mary and his wife. By early in 1871, there was friction between the two Marys, and Mary chose to move to Clifton House. Mary became quite ill in 1871 and was showing signs, and Tad was showing signs of illness also. So they returned to Chicago. Mary improved, but Tad, just 18 years of age, gradually became weaker, and on July 15th of 1871, he died at the Clifton House. The cause of his death was dropsy of the chest, or tuberculosis, as we call it now. You can imagine following the death of her four-year-old Eddie, 11-year-old Willie, her beloved husband, Abraham Lincoln, and now 18-year-old Tad. She grieved and began steady emotional mental decline. Mary received no comfort from Robert as she grieved the loss of Tad. In fact, 10 days after Tad's death, Robert left for Rocky Mountains where he remained in seclusion for a month. The local locale was favorable place for men who were suffering from nervous disorders. Robert would later express that he had been all used up after his brother's death. As Mary mourned the loss of another son, she became a wanderer. She went from St. Charles, Illinois, 1871, Waukesha, Wisconsin, 1872, Moravia, New York, 1872, Boston, 1872, Chicago, Illinois, 1872, Buffalo, New York, 1873, to Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1874, to Savannah, Georgia in 1875, and Jacksonville, Florida, in 1875 also, and then back to Chicago in 1875. Soon Mary was no longer welcome in Robert's house. It may have been because she learned of her daughter-in-law's struggle with alcoholism. Mary, who now despised the 14th and 15th of each month, the anniversary dates of Lincoln's death and Tad's death, respectively turned more and more to the spiritualists and mediums to find comfort. In 1872, Tad's estate was ready for disbursement and Mary offered to split the estate uh, worth $35,500 with Robert, even though the law entitled her to two-thirds. She loaned Robert 10000 for a real estate investment she then traveled to Waukesha, Wisconsin, and settled near the Hell Spas, next to Lake Michigan. In 1873, Mary traveled to Canada. In 1875, she desired warmth and traveled to Green Cove, Florida. As the 10th anniversary of her husband's death neared, Mary had a premonition that Robert was dying. Hastily, she left for Chicago, where she was relie relieved to find him in good health, but angry at her for all of her ridiculous fuss. She stopped for items that she didn't need, and then purchased the item in large quantities. At one more point, she ordered eight pairs of lace curtains for windows she didn't have, and patiently waited for their arrival. When a knock on the, came on the door, expecting the caller to be the delivery of the curtains, she opened the door and was surprised to find two uniformed men at a, and an attorney. The same attorney who nominated her husband 
for president in 1860. It was then Mary learned that she was being charged with lunacy and was directed to attend the trial immediately where a jury, jury would deliberate her sanity. Mary told the men, you mean to say I am crazy? I am much obliged to you, but I'm abundantly able to take care of myself. Where's my son, Robert? It was later Mary learned that it was Robert who took out the warrant for her arrest and Luna, as a lunatic. In fact, he hired Pinkerton men to follow her throughout her travels and meetings with mediums and spiritualists. He also questioned the doctors, maids, waiters, and store clerks, and then petitioned them to testify against her. One, one by one, they did so, and concurred with, Mary, with Robert's assessment on his mother, and that his mother was insane. Mary had four defense, one that was appointed by her, Robert, and it, and it was prearranged that the attorney would not provide her a defense that was in her best interest. It only took the all-male jury 10 minutes to return a verdict, guilty of insanity. Her sentence was to hand over her bonds, give control of her money to a court-appointed conservator, and accept detention in private asylum in Behavia, Batavia, Illinois. If Mary's trial had been held in the modern day, she never would have been charged with lunacy, maybe eccentricity, but not lunacy. Mary was being condemned for being a, ahead of her time. May 20th, 1875, Mary is, in, is admitted to Bellevue, and from the moment she passed through the doors, she was planning her exit. Not to escape, but a legal exit. She had a couple of very good attorneys. One of them was a woman, and the court would not accept this woman's being there and defending Mary Lincoln because she was a woman. And she was told that the woman's place was in the home raising children. When the, New York, when the Chicago Times reporter, reporter asked her if Mary Lincoln was insane, Myra replied, Mary Lincoln is no more insane than I am. <clears throat> While Myra worked outside, Mary worked inside with, uh, and prearranged with uh, her sister Elizabeth that she would reside at her home in Springfield after her release. Initially, Elizabeth agreed until Robert stepped in and applied pressure to Mary, to, to Elizabeth, to, to deny Mary's request. He even concocted several stories to further declare his mother's lunacy and was able to sway Elizabeth to his side. Myra privately met with Elizabeth and set the record straight and Elizabeth held firm to her offer to, for Mary to join her. Uh, Judge Bradwell sent a letter to Bellevue threatening habeas corpus. Robert continued to pay doctors with Mary's money for their prognosis, which of course supported his theory. Myra had petitioned for and obtained Mary's release after three months and three weeks one of the shortest confinements in the, in the asylum's history. Mary was cheerful and, and sociable at her sister's home um, in Springfield. She would not be free, however. She knew Robert was still pursuing his quest to have her committed, so she thought to bargain with him. 
She made him an offer that if he would, would place her money in a Springfield bank, she would release him to him the contents of her current will, naming him and his daughter heirs to her estate. There was a veiled threat amid the words that if he did not comply, she would disinherit him. Finally, Robert complied. Uh, on June 15, 1876, another jury found her restored to reason and capable to manage and control her estate. Robert returned to marry $73,000, including $60,000 in bonds. With the ruling, Mary wasted no time forwarding a letter to her son and she demanded the immediate return of all her personal belongings that he still possessed. She signed the letter, Mrs. A. Lincoln. She also returned the items that Robert had given her, which didn't amount to much. The gift giving had been obviously one-sided. Her funds restored, Mary traveled to Europe. She settled in Po, France, there she spent four years. I live very much alone, she wrote in 1877, and do not identify myself with the French. Have a few friends and prefer to remain secluded. She traveled extensively to Rome, Naples, Sorrento, Vichy, and in 1879, Ulysses and Julia Grant traveled to Po. And although they knew Mary was residing there, they didn't visit her. The old Mary would have felt slighted and snubbed, but she looked upon their act with indifference. In 1880, after two falls, she wrote to her sister, I cannot trust myself any longer away from you all. I am too ill and feeble in health. She returned to her sister's home within a year, weighing 100 pounds, Mary was nearly blind. She was diagnosed with kidney, eye, and back problems. The New York reporter interviewed the physician who treated Mary and asked the, the ailing woman's sanity. He responded, she's no more insane than you and I. And if you come with me to talk with her, you would understand that. With her medical bills rising, 64 year old, Mary petitioned Congress to release, increase her pension. It was increased to $5,000 a year with $15,000 in back pay. She never collected one cent of that money. On July 15, 1882, on the anniversary of Tad's death, she collapsed in her bedroom and that evening fell into a coma. On July 16th, Mary Todd Lincoln died of a stroke. She was buried on July 8, 19th, and the Springfield mayor declared a holiday in observance. Thousands lined the street. The First Presbyterian Church was crowded. For once, the newspapers were kind to her and restored her character in death. Although she was reported to be in good health upon her arrival in Springfield, this was not true. In truth, she was slowly going blind. Her son Robert visited in 1881. Mary stayed all by herself in a shaded room in the Edwards house. What would Mary's life have been like had those who rallied at her death had rallied during her life after the service Robert and Mary's sister led the procession to Oak Hill Cemetery, where she was laid to rest among those who were, had abandoned her throughout her life. In 1884, Robert inherited his mother's estate, not because he was listed in his mother's will, but because, but because um, Illinois State named him as her natural heir. Mary had destroyed the only copy of her will. 
And that is the sad, sad story of Mary Lincoln. May she rest in peace. <coughs> Thank you for your kind attention.